So good evening, Ashram, and everybody who is joining us online. And we hope that all the guests of the Ashram are having a good stay, enjoying your time here at the Ashram. And tonight uh, we will be sharing some teachings about the important yogic principle and yogic practice known as Ahimsa. Ahimsa means non-violence. Uh, himsa means violence, ahimsa means non-violence. In Sanskrit, sometimes several words, the moment that you add a at the front, it gives the opposite meaning. So, himsa means violence and ahimsa means non-violence. Uh, this term ahimsa uh, became very famous around the world as this was a key practice of Mahatma Gandhi this was a main principle that Mahatma Gandhi was practicing, and this was the leading power and the movement of uh, liberating India from the British rule. And this was the inspiration for Martin Luther King in the US. Martin Luther King, who was studying about the life of Mahatma Gandhi and saw how this nonviolent uh, resistance was a means to bring upon a major change in society. So Martin Luther King uh, practiced and uh, made this as a key uh, aspect of his life in the civil rights movement was this practice of Ahimsa to bring upon a change. So Ahimsa uh, is one of the main practices described in the yogic teachings in different yogic scriptures. It is known in Sanskrit as Ahimsa uh, paramo dharma, or meaning the supreme dharma, meaning that ahimsa is the main uh, guideline for our spiritual evolution, leading a life that is uh, based in ahimsa, non-violence. So tonight we'll share some teachings of Swami Shivananda from this book, Bliss Divine, about this uh, practice of ahimsa, what does it mean, and what is its a value in our spiritual life? Why nonviolence is is the key of our uh, spiritual path? See, Swami Shivananda explains that ahimsa or not hurting others is a practice that has to be done on three different levels: on the physical level, on the verbal level, and on the mental level. To be a practitioner of Ahimsa, we need to learn to have this capacity of not hurting others on the level of action, the level of speech, and ultimately on the level of the mind. Because many times we say, oh, you need to practice nonviolence. We think, okay, I haven't punched anybody since second grade. I'm, <laughs> I'm quite good at Ahimsa. But what Swami Shivananda is teaching that a failure in Ahimsa will be, of course, on the level of speech. And we know how many times or how difficult it is to say things that will not be hurtful for others. And from the yogic point of view, a, a break in Ahimsa would be even if we say something and the person didn't directly hear it. You know, it's one thing not to say something hurtful in front of the person. It's a much more advanced practice not to say anything hurtful when the person is not there. To be able to speak in a way that even if the person would hear you, they would not be hurt by it. This is a practice of Ahimsa. And ultimately, the highest practice of Ahimsa is on the level of the mind. That even if all of our thoughts would be projected on our Instagram account, <laughs> and our profile, they would see directly everything that we're thinking, those thoughts will not be hurtful to anybody. Those thoughts would be harmless. So this is the type of practice that the yogis are guiding us, that this is the, the way of life that will lead us to real happiness, that will lead us to the capacity to see reality as it truly is. So. We'll share a few words of Swami Shivananda about uh, this uh, fundamental yogic principle of Ahimsa. So Swamiji writes, Ahimsa, or non-injury, of course, implies non-killing. 
but non-injury is not merely non-killing. It is, in its comprehensive meaning, ahimsa or non-injury means entire abstinence from causing any pain or harm whatsoever to any living creature, either by thought, word, or deed. Non-injury needs a harmless mind, mouth, and hand. So this practice of ahimsa is taught uh, in the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, which is the main scripture uh, that guides about meditation, mind control, the capacity to have a meditative mind, a mind that can focus, a mind that is peaceful, a mind that is pure. And ahimsa is considered to be the foundation, meaning our capacity to meditate is based on our practice of ahimsa. As we become better in ahimsa, the more the mind will be capable of meditation, which basically what it implies that if we are not able to meditate now, we can be sure that we have some breaks in ahimsa. It's not that we are, maybe our back is not so straight, <laughs> maybe, you know, our sitting position, the feet is not in the exact position, May, uh, maybe we don't have the best, we don't have the right mantra, or we don't know the technique. The yogis are saying, really speaking, the reason we're not able to meditate now is because there are what's called impurities in the mind. And this ahimsa is in the foundation of the mind being either pure or impure. Is there animosity? Is there hatred? Is there negativity? towards ourself or towards others. These are what yogis call impurities. And as long as this negativity is there in the mind, meditation can never really take place, not real meditation. Real meditation can only come in a mind that is full of light, full of purity, full of love. That mind is gonna be able to rest in its true nature. But the mind that is uh, agitated uh, with these different types of negativities, meditation cannot take place. So what the yogis are teaching, if we're not able to meditate, yes, we have to work on our technique, we have to work on the posture, but the main thing is we have to work on our life. Somewhere in how we relate to life, somewhere how do we relate to others, because life is really relationships. This is the key thing in our life. How, how do we interact with people? Uh, interaction in speech and interaction in thoughts. How are we thinking about other people? What type, is there loving thoughts in the mind? Or oh, there is a lot of judgment, criticism, negativity. If that is how we are relating to the world, how can we expect to be at peace? How can we expect to to realize the divine nature. Because obviously, you see, when our mind is ever negative and harmful towards others, that, uh, that type of a harm originates from not seeing the divine, but seeing others as others, originating basically from our ego. So if all these thoughts, we allow them to uh, take root in our mind, then what we're basically doing is we are strengthening the strong notion of others being others. And we are minimizing our ability to see others for what they truly are, divine or our own self. So if we would really see God in others, there will be no reason for fear, there will be no reason for jealousy, and there will definitely be no reason for hatred. So as long as hatred is there, God is not there, or God is not perceived, basically. So meditation is about connecting with the divine. But if our interaction with others are negative, even on the level of the mind, our capacity to connect with the divine is hindered. So meditation, real meditation, cannot take place. So ahimsa, is the main thing that one has to cultivate in order to be able to grow spiritually, in order to be able to attain peace of mind, basically. 
Now, what Swami Shivananda explains, you see, to shift the mind out of the ordinary state of being negative, of being judgmental, of being hurtful towards others, is not easy. The way that we're able to shift is by the cultivation of love. Love is the antidote for the harm. If the mind is full of love, if we do actions of service, if we speak in a kind way, and if ultimately we learn to think in a kind way, that will uproot the tendency of responding in harm. Without love being there, uh, the force of our past impressions, the strong desires and attachments will always lead to some type of a resentment towards others. It's unavoidable. So the yogis are explaining that ahimsa is not just uh, holding ourselves back, tying ourselves, I'm not going to hurt anybody, putting like a big, uh, <laughs> walking with a constant mask where you cannot speak, somehow tying up the mind. But ahimsa is really the practice of cosmic love. The only way not to hurt is by being established in love. And what does it mean to be established in love? It means practicing devotion, growing in divine love, real love. Love means unconditional love. Ordinary love will lead to breaks in ahimsa. Basically, Swami Vishnu used to say, in ordinary relationships, you have two mantras. I love you, honey. I love you, honey. And then go to hell, honey. And that is what, you know, ordinary conditional love. That will definitely lead to break in ahimsa, one moment or the other. But the, the, the capacity to be established in ahimsa is growing in divine love, growing in the awareness of the sacred. So ahimsa is telling us if we want to be able to meditate, we have to see how our daily life is full with the remembrance of the divine. Then, when we see the divine in others, we will gradually be capable of being kinder, being more compassionate, being more forgiving. No, the biggest, one of the biggest challenges in Ahimsa is the, the inability to forgive. We get hurt and we resent. But capacity to be really in Ahimsa based on forgiveness. And forgiveness is requires this awareness of the divine nature behind things, then we are much more qualified to forgive. So, I'll share a few more words with Swami Shivananda. Swamiji says, eh, Ahimsa is not a mere negative non-injuring. It is a positive cosmic love. It is the development of the mental attitude in which hatred is replaced by love. Ahimsa is true sacrifice. Why do you think, why does Swami Shivananda say Ahimsa is a true sacrifice? It's really hard not to be violent, not to react in anger. And what Master is explaining is that to be able to respond with love requires a tremendous sacrifice because the mind will be inclined to respond in some type of a, a what you call a knee-jerk response, trying to prove oneself. So Shivananda explains that the real strength is the strength of ahimsa, the capacity to bear insult, to bear injury, the capacity to forgive. Basically, one has to sacrifice his or her selfishness, his or her desires, attachments, sacrifice the ego for the sake of ahimsa. Otherwise, it's not possible. The ego is the main uh, obstacle for love. The ego is the main obstacle for ahimsa and is the main obstacle for God, for freedom and happiness. So in order for us to be able to be good practitioners of Ahimsa, 
this is requires great spiritual maturity because we will react and we need to be able to see the anger manifesting in the mind and then like Swami Shivananda would say we have to tell ourselves do we want to be a slave of that anger do we want to be always ruled by it or we want to be free and happy and then growing in our capacity step by step as we respond again and again with ahimsa so Swamiji says ahimsa is forgiveness ahimsa is shakti means power ahimsa is true strength now master shivananda is pointing a few more uh, unique types of ahimsa where just to be aware of more subtle forms where we may be lacking in ahimsa where we may be failing and it's good to understand this because definitely as we mentioned if we're not able to meditate it is because somewhere we are uh, lacking the skill in ahimsa and sometimes we are not aware of where we are making these mistakes so samiji writes only the ordinary people think that ahimsa is not to hurt, to hurt any living being physically. This is but the gross form of ahimsa. So physical violence is just the gross form. The vow of ahimsa is broken even by showing contempt towards another man, by entertaining unreasonable dislike for or, or prejudice towards anybody. So just this strong type of a dislike towards a person, which is a common experience that we may have. Uh, this would be, of course, a break in ahimsa. Uh, by frowning at another man, by hating another man, by abusing another man, by speaking ill of others. This is definitely a universal type of a break in ahimsa. Not, re not making the effort that our speech will be kind. Even if we disagree with somebody, even if we have a, a dislike in the mind, but to make the speech still sweet about the person that we may even disagree with, and even if that person is not there, still to be aware that we don't want to be hurtful for the feelings of that person if they would have heard us. That's the type of practice by backbiting or vilifying. So this was something Swami Shivananda always emphasized, the harmful effects of backbiting. Harmful effects, mostly for us. We are the ones who get caught in the cage of our ego with this tendency of backbiting. Because obviously we don't see the other person as our own self, and we are creating a bigger separation, more suffering for ourselves. And by harboring thoughts of hatred or uttering lies or ruining another man in any way whatsoever. All harsh and rude speech is himsa, violence. Using harsh words, uh, wounding the feelings of others by gesture, expression, tone of voice. So sometimes even just, we don't have to say something, but just our behavior can be rude or rough or aggressive and this would be a failure in ahimsa tone of voice a slighting or showing deliberate discourtesy to a person before others is wanton himsa so then Swamiji also says something very important to approve of another's harsh actions is indirect himsa so also if we see somebody who is behaving in a way that is hurtful for others and we don't do our level best to address that, this will also be a failure in, in Himsa. If we see Himsa and we don't do the best that we can to prevent that, that's also failure in Himsa. Meaning we're not really caring to try to resolve this wrongdoing or the hurt towards others. 
to fail to relieve another's pain or even to neglect to go to the person in distress is sort of himsa. So not just that if we didn't, we didn't do anything to hurt, but if we are aware of somebody who is hurting and we don't do our level best to try to relieve their suffering, this is also a failure. So no, sometimes you can do something physically. Sometimes you can do something with a speech. And sometimes it may be only doing something by prayer. But the idea is that if we are aware that somebody is suffering and we're not doing our level best to relieve it and we are conscious of their suffering, this is also a break in himsa. Not caring or not trying our level best to relieve the suffering. So Samiji finally says, um, avoid strictly all forms of harshness, direct or indirect, positive or negative, immediate or delayed. Practice ahimsa in its purest form and become divine. Ahimsa and divinity are one, meaning our true nature shines through when our mind becomes harmless, when our mind is becomes free from all this harshness, we will be a channel for the divine. So, and meditation will come naturally for us. So, more we will share in a few days' time about this practice of Ahimsa. Shanti Shanti Om Peace Peace Peace